The Chicago Blackhawks are getting real tough to watch as they've now dropped 29 of their last 35 games. And on today's episode, I'll be recapping their lackluster 5-2 defeat to the Columbus Blue Jackets from over the weekend, plus a preview of tonight's tough matchup with the Colorado Avalanche. And I'll wrap things up with our weekly Mailbag Monday fan segment. All that and plenty more right here on Locked On Blackhawks. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everyone? Welcome on into another episode of Locked On Blackhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. Go and give me a follow on X at Jack Bushman too. And make sure to also go and follow my strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And just a quick reminder to everyone watching this on YouTube right now, hit that like button, comment down below and subscribe to the Lockdown Blackhawks YouTube channel. Go and subscribe for Celebrini as the new motto here on the show. And if you're a frequent audio listener of the podcast, if you're tuning in today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever it may be, make sure that you're constantly downloading all of those latest episodes episodes. You can go and rate and review the show as well. It won't cost you anything. It's all 100% free and really does help me out tremendously. And I also got to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the best place to bet on the NBA. Sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash on to start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. <sighs> As the thumbnail reads here today, Blackhawks fans, it is getting real tough to watch this team. After their 5-0 loss to the Colorado Avalanche last Thursday, the Hawks were back in action once again at the United Center over the weekend before they head out west for a little mini three-game road trip. And after having some tough competition on the schedule in the past week or so uh, against the Winnipeg Jets, the Detroit Red Wings, who have been climbing in the right direction up the standings, and of course, the Colorado Avalanche coming into town last Thursday, it felt like Saturday's contest against the Columbus Blue Jackets, the second meeting between these two teams this season, felt like a good opportunity for the Blackhawks to bounce back and go and pick up a, a rather nice W, go and reward all the fans in attendance at the United Center, a Saturday night game. I'm sure the crowd was lively and considering how brutal the month of February was for the Blackhawks, as I mentioned on last Friday's episode, the Hawks went one, six and three in 10 games during the month of February and nine of those 10 games came on home ice. So they really didn't take advantage of a huge stretch at the UC. And I was really hoping that they were going to be able to pick up a bounce back victory against the Blue Jackets on Saturday. But that is not what ended up happening, Blackhawks fans. Like the first meeting bet between these two teams earlier this season, which actually, uh, if you all remember correctly, that was when the whole Corey Perry saga actually began. He was supposed to play in that game against Columbus, wasn't on the ice for pregame warmups, and everyone's like, whoa, what's going on here with Corey Perry? He'd been playing well so far for the Blackhawks this season. No way he's a healthy scratch, right? And then everything unfolds after that. But that uh, preluded a horrible Blackhawks performance out in Columbus, one of their worst of the entire season, believe it or not. And they put up another pretty ugly stinker here on Saturday on home ice. And that was what was really disappointing to me, the Blue Jackets, one of the bottom five teams in the NHL along with the Hawks, and a Saturday night game with a lot of buzz in the building, an opportunity to reward all the fans who, despite this team being in last place all season long, still are consistently making trips to the United Center, and they didn't do that whatsoever, and it was brutal right out of the gate from the Blackhawks. 30 seconds in, Seth Jones makes a horrible turnover. Alexander Texier uh, snipes one past Arvid Soderbloom to go up one to nothing. Boone Jenner with a redirect uh, to double the Blue Jackets lead there in the opening 20 minutes. It felt like going into the second period, the Blackhawks had a little bit of life as they kicked off the scoring. Who else but 
Uh, Philip Kurashev, who has just been excellent, one of the few players on this Blackhawks roster that has been excellent all season long. He cuts the deficit to two to one. And kind of funny enough, it was two blunders by two former Blackhawks on that play for Columbus that kind of led to that goal. Adam Boquist gets taken out in the uh, right corner by Kurashev. And then Alex Nylander, who recently was acquired by the Blue Jackets from Pittsburgh, he has the puck down below his own net. Uh, Connor Bedard goes and forces a turnover on him. Ryan Donato sets up Kurashev in front to cut it to two to one. So despite the Blackhawks getting off to an awful start, I thought they had some life going into the second period. Potentially they failed to capitalize on it. And the second period was just a, another missed opportunity for this team. And a, just a lot of bad hockey being played by the Blackhawks all night long. Columbus goes on to extend their lead to four to one after 40 minutes. They had a 28 to 17 shots on goal advantage. Um, it's just disappointing that this Blackhawks team after look, I know they got blown out by the Colorado avalanche on Thursday, but put up a really solid performance against the Red Wings in the game prior to that coming off of a really impressive OT loss to the Winnipeg jets in the game prior to that. And they go and do this against the Columbus blue jackets, man. It makes it tough to watch this team. It makes it's, it's really starting to wear on me. Blackhawks fans. I turned this game off after the second period. I'm not going to lie to you. I had no interest in spending more of my Saturday night watching this Blackhawks team play that badly against one of the other worst teams in the entire NHL. It's sad, and it really has me counting down the games until the season is over for the Blackhawks. The only good part of all this losing, like I mentioned on Friday's episode, is it's continuing to put them in a good spot to win the Macklin Celebrini sweepstakes. Hawks have now lost 14 of their last 15 games and 29 of their last 35, and oh yeah, Still haven't won a road game since all the way back on November 9th, over three months ago. It's unfathomable how bad this team is. And yeah, it's just getting really tough to watch here down the stretch of the season. But with yet another loss on Saturday night, Blackhawks fans, the Hawks do remain in 32nd place, dead last in the NHL standings. And with San Jose picking up an overtime loss over the weekend as well, they are now officially one point ahead of the Blackhawks in the race for the Macklin Celebrini sweepstakes. Hawks are now 15, 41, and 5 through 61 games. They've lost 46 of 61 games. That gives them a .287 points percentage on the season. The Sharks are now 15, 39, and 6 with 36 points through 60 games. So Blackhawks still have one more game played than the Sharks. That gives them a .300 points percentage. But as I also mentioned on Friday, the San Jose Sharks certainly have the more difficult of the two schedules in comparison uh, to the Blackhawks in the month of March. March is, I, I'm not going to say uh, it's a cakewalk for the Blackhawks because it doesn't matter who they who they play. If they play a good team, they play well, and then they end up getting beat. And you're like, oh, okay, if they play a bad team like that, they'll, they'll be just fine. They go and put up that type of performance against Columbus and lose five to two. So uh, yeah, there's winning opportunities for the Blackhawks here in the month of March, two games against Arizona, two games against LA, San Jose, Anaheim, but they still got to go out there and win them. And as they've only won 15 of uh, 61 games so far this season, it's, you know, anything but a lock for the Blackhawks to get the job done in those matchups. So yeah, that's the only bright spot of this losing, but I'll tell you what, Blackhawks fans, it is getting really hard to watch this team. They take on the Colorado Avalanche in Denver here tonight at 8 p.m. Central Time. It's a late start. Hard to envision the Blackhawks going into that building where they've really struggled over the last few years and putting up a good fight. Crazier things have happened, but what we saw on Saturday against Columbus was far from encouraging and uh, just another frustrating performance. And Luke Richardson, look, I don't talk about this very often on the show, man, but these are the performances that have to make you wonder about whether Luke Richardson is the answer as the head coach for the Blackhawks. And truthfully, we're not going to know that answer probably until at the earliest, like midseason at the end of next year, when it looks like the Hawks, fingers crossed, could hopefully be a little bit better. Um, it is just tough to dictate whether or not he's a good head coach when the roster is this underwhelming and all the injuries and whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, man, you still got to see some sort of progression you would think from this Blackhawks team. And 
we just haven't seen that consistently enough this season. So, yeah, I, I know people are questioning whether Luke is the guy, and I think it's fair to question because we just don't know one way or the other. Um, it's really difficult to tell right now, but there are going to be some meaningful games coming up for him. Probably not this season, but once the Blackhawks add some guys in the offseason and get healthier heading into next year, I think the front office is going to want to see some signs of progress. And uh, these losses – that they've had two teams like the Columbus Blue Jackets are far from encouraging that uh, the Blackhawks are heading in the right direction at this point in time. So, yeah, yet another loss for the Blackhawks over the weekend, man. It was a, a painful one. 5-2 to two to the Columbus Blue Jackets. They've now dropped 14 of their last 15 games. All right, there are my thoughts from the 5-2 to two loss to the Blue Jackets at the United Center on Saturday. Coming up in just a moment, Blackhawks fans, I will get into my quick preview of tonight's matchup, another toughie for the Hawks against the Colorado Avalanche out in Denver. But first, I need to talk to you all about FanDuel. Go and get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, if you're a new customer, you can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's right. You can get $150 in bonus bets if your $5 money line bet wins. And you can use these bonuses to bet on everything from your favorite players to favorite teams, quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive player props, and much, much more. All on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. And the NBA is taking over here now that football season has wrapped up. So it's a perfect time to go and place a wager down on LeBron James, Luka Doncic, Joel Embiid. Ish Smith and some of the other top players in the NBA. And if you go and sign up today, visit fanduel.com slash locked on to start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. Again, that's fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel, an official partner of the NBA. Back here on the Locked On Blackhawks podcast, the Blackhawks take on the Colorado Avalanche out in Denver at 8 p.m. Central Time, the fourth and final meeting between these two Central Division teams this season. And you can catch all of the action of the Blackhawks' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. All you have to do is go and search Blackhawks. All right, segment two, getting into a preview of Tonight's matchup with the Colorado Avalanche, the second time that these two teams are playing in what a five-day stretch. And after the Blackhawks, um, in the second meeting between these two teams this season, the Blackhawks actually managed to muster up a 4-3 to three win over the Avs on home ice. Couldn't do the same in this following matchup, despite getting off to a good start. In the first period, the Blackhawks had a 13-5 to five shots advantage over the Avs. It was nothing-nothing until the final couple of minutes, and once the Avs scored that opening goal, it felt like it really opened the door for them to kind of open up the floodgates, if you will, there in the second period where they went on to add three more and break this game open. The final 40 from the Blackhawks were not very encouraging, but they did get off to a good start, but it just felt like they couldn't capture any momentum. They really just let it slip out of their hands, and you could tell the frustration just started to boil over, and from all the losses that the Blackhawks have been dealing with recently, it felt like it all came out on the ice in that game against the Avalanche, right? And we saw Peter Morazic yelling at Jacob Megna. But even more than that, we saw Connor Bedard, I think, play with some frustration or as much frustration as we've seen throughout the course of this season because there were definitely some penalties that went uncalled out there and looked like Bedard wasn't getting a lot of help from his line mates or from his teammates in those final two periods. He was kind of trying to do everything himself and dance through uh, the avalanche defenders to no avail. And you could just tell he was super agitated, super frustrated out there. Uh, took a bad whack from Josh Manson on the gloves there at the end of that game. And I'm really interested to see what kind of intensity the Blackhawks are going to come out with tonight. And if, if they don't come out ready to go right from, right from the opening whistle, look, I'm going to be honest here. I already don't believe this Blackhawks team stands a chance going into ball arena, a place they have not played well in the last handful of years uh, against a really good avalanche team that they just kind of, in terms of a matchup, I, I think it's just not a good matchup for the Blackhawks with all the speed that the Colorado avalanche have and how they can cycle and dominate in the offensive zone. It's a tough matchup for the Blackhawks. And I think the only opportunity that they have for some life is to play with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder in this one and 
not only go and prove to the Avalanche that they're more like the team that they faced in the first period last time than the team that they saw in the final 40 minutes, but also that they're just not going to get bullied. They're not going to get pushed around out there. And that's kind of what happened at the UC last Thursday night in those final two periods. The Avalanche did whatever they wanted. They had it going, had all the momentum on their side, and they kind of got away with also doing whatever they wanted to counter Bedard out there on the ice, right? And I was a little upset that the Blackhawks didn't, I don't want to say retaliate, but at least didn't stick up for Bedard a little bit more in that game. And I felt like just the circumstances of the scoreboard, where the game was at, um, just feeling like, I, I think the Blackhawks kind of got a feeling that it just wasn't their night. They were getting blown out on home ice. And I think that kind of, came to the forefront instead of protecting Bedard and doing all these good things to help out your 18 year old superstar. I feel like that's got to be prevalent on the Blackhawks mindset right from the opening faceoff tonight, not only to protect Bedard, but to be the aggressors out there to not be the ones that just allows the abs to do whatever they want out there. I think the Blackhawks got to come ready right from the opening faceoff and just got to show some edge, got to show some grit, got to show some tenacity. Reese Johnson, Go and get in a fight, but not when you're down three or four to nothing. Go and do it early. I don't care if it's an opportunity to get the Denver crowd into it. I think the Blackhawks have to send that message early. That, yeah, we're the worst team in the NHL. We understand that. This is a lopsided matchup, but we're not just going to roll over and give it to you. Again, like it kind of happened in the Final 40 at the UC on Thursday. I think that's really important for the Blackhawks to just show that it's not going to be a cakewalk and an easy peasy one for this Avs bunch on home ice. So I really hope that the Blackhawks respond well in the early going. I don't know if I'm going to give them any chance in hell to come away with the win, but uh, it, it would be nice to see this team put up a sharp performance here tonight against the Avs in the final meeting between these two teams this season. As far as what we could see out of the Blackhawks lineup, Checking social media right now because they are out in Denver. I'm recording this at uh, it's noon exactly right now, funny enough. So that means it's 11 out in Denver. Doesn't look like the Blackhawks have hit the ice for their morning skate and no official guarantee that they're even going to do so. So uh, a little bit of a guess here on what the Blackhawks lineup is going to be. But based on what we saw Oh, uh, on Saturday against the Columbus Blue Jackets. I think you probably got to keep the Donato, Bedard, and Kurashev trio together as they accounted for both of the Blackhawks goals. And Philip Kurashev certainly was one of the better Hawks players on the night in that one. His speed, man, and the confidence that he's playing with, it is just so noticeable out there. And Ryan Donato, someone who's kind of been up and down the lineup throughout the course of this season, been a little bit quieter in a bottom six role lately. Nice to see him. In his first game, bumped up there. Really make the most of that opportunity. And he is someone who quietly has played pretty good when getting the chance with Connor Bedard this season. So I certainly wouldn't hate to see that trio uh, remain together once again here tonight. Colin Blackwell, Jason Dickinson, Joey Anderson. I think you got to roll with them as the second line. Nick Foligno, Tyler Johnson, and Taylor Radish was the third line on Saturday night. I do like the looks of that group, although... Taylor Radish, man, he's got to break that skid. Guy cannot buy a goal right now, and I'm sure it's frustrating times for him. The confidence probably isn't all there. He's probably sitting there wondering what he actually has to do to get the puck in the back of the net. Um, I do wonder, man, if the Blackhawks – Consider moving Anthony Beauvillier to that third line. I just think Taylor Radish's struggles right now are so evident. And Beauvillier, look, hasn't been like excellent or anything, but how many opportunities are you going to give Taylor Radish inside the top nine? And it just hasn't worked really all year long. Boris Kachuk was back in the lineup on Saturday. I personally like to see that. I know no one else really cares besides me. Beauvillier was actually centering the fourth line with Reese Johnson on the wing while uh, Mackenzie Entwistle was the odd man out. I don't understand why Reese Johnson doesn't play center for this Blackhawks team or why he doesn't take more faceoffs because he's been above 50% every year in his NHL career. And he's been playing on that right wing most of this season. Um, we'll see if Entwistle gets back in there. I hope Kachuk gets to play again. Wouldn't be surprised though if, uh, like, I, I wouldn't hate to see Kachuk, Reese Johnson in the middle, Taylor Radish on the right hand side, bump Beauvillier up to that third line. That's what I would be doing here tonight. And then on defense, Alex Vlasic, Seth Jones, obviously the top pairing for the Blackhawks, number one and number two defenseman for this team. All season long, despite Seth Jones having a 
rather rocky night against his former team in the Blue Jackets on Saturday. Still got to be playing him darn near half the game because of what the Blackhawks have to roll with on the rest of their blue line. Kevin Korchinski, Jacob Magna, who has certainly come back down to earth after a really hot start to his Blackhawks tenure. Um, he's been slumping a little bit here recently. And then poor Isaac Phillips and Louis Crevier were forced to be the third pairing for the Blackhawks on Saturday. That did not go very well. Uh, Jared Tenorti should be able to go here tonight in Denver. I imagine if that is the case, he'll be back in there with Louis Crevier on the right-hand side. Not a very good performance out of Isaac Phillips on Saturday. So it's kind of the only options the Blackhawks have on their blue line because Nikita Zaitsev still isn't ready. Connor Murphy still isn't skating. On the bright side, it does sound like the Hawks are going to get Andreas Athanasiu back in their forward group, possibly uh, over the weekend when the Hawks take on the Washington Capitals. Then Peter Morazic's got to be in net here tonight. I believe this will be his 40th start of the season for the Blackhawks, maybe his 41st. Uh, you got to play him in Denver or else there is the chance that this thing gets ugly if Arvid Soderblom gets in there. And I didn't think Sar it's kind of the same story every game for Arvid Soderblom. Let's in one or two softies. There's a couple he really can't do anything about. But the clear difference between him and Morazic is Soderblom just doesn't have that ability to steal games right now. He's going to give up at least three every time he's in the net. And how many times do we see this Blackhawks offense score three goals? Not very frequently. So it's just hard to win games when Arvid Soderblom is in net. He hasn't won a game since all the way back on November 24th. Just been a brutal season for him. I think he's now 2-19-1. Uh, yeah, the struggles continue for Soderblom. I don't think he played terrible on Saturday, but he doesn't have that game-changing ceiling that Peter Morazic does when he's on his A game. Um, out of these last 21 games on the schedule, 20, 21 games on the schedule for the Blackhawks, I bet Morazic will probably play 14 or 15 of them. Soderblom just has not been consistent enough this season. Uh, he has been better recently, but again, just doesn't have that ceiling to lift the Blackhawks, to steal a victory. So, yeah, Peter Morazic, I think, is the uh, clear cut. Got to go in net tonight against a really good Avalanche offense. All right, there's my preview of tonight's matchup with the Colorado Avalanche. Coming up in just a moment, Blackhawks fans, I still have to get into our weekly Mailbag Monday fan segment. But first, I got to talk to you all about game time. You shouldn't have to worry or stress when you're buying tickets to the next big event. And game time is the perfect, fast, and easy way for you to buy all the tickets to the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. And I personally have used game time since I was back in high school when I was 16, 17, 18, going on down to the UC to watch Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, and all of those Blackhawks legends during the dynasty days, or even when I'm going down to the UC still today to go and watch Connor Bedard, I use game time. If I'm wanting to go out to Wrigley Field during the summer and catch the Cubbies playing a baseball game, I'll use game time. Or even if I'm traveling in another city, if me and one of my buddies want to go see a comedy event or uh, want to go and see a theater event or something along those lines. Game time is always the number one place that I check. They have the cheapest and the fastest way for you to purchase all of your tickets. Plus, what I love is they show you seats before you purchase your tickets from every seat in the house so you know exactly what to expect upon arrival or before you purchase. I highly recommend you all go and download the Game Time app right now. And when you do, create an account and use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps for $20 off with your first purchase. Again, you can get $20 off to come and see Connor Bedard play at the United Center this year. All you got to do is download the Game Time app and use the code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed, game time. Back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. If you're still tuned into this point of today's episode, still listening about this awful Blackhawks team, thank you very much. I really do appreciate all your support. It's really the only reason I'm still going here because all these losses. Are they're making me hate watching the Chicago Blackhawks. And it makes it tough to talk about. I, I don't really know what else to say. It's the same problems that plague this team all year long. They can't score. 
bad defense, bad on home ice, just all bad. It's re- really getting annoying. So I appreciate all the support out there. Go and smash the like button, comment down below, and subscribe to the Lockdown Blackhawks YouTube channel if you're still watching on YouTube. And also make sure to go and check out the new Lockdown Sports today because Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And... Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. So go check out Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, before I wrap things up here today, still got to get into the weekly Mailbag Monday fan segment. I uh, got five or six questions to answer here on today's show. And just a reminder, if you have a question that you want answered by yours truly this time next week, go and drop that down below right now in the comments section. You can DM me on any one of my social media channels. You can email LockdownBlackHawks at gmail.com. You can even jump into the community tab on the Lockdown Blackhawks. YouTube channel. So make sure to go and do that. If you have a question, I greatly enjoy interacting with all of you fans and listeners and viewers out there. So yeah, make sure to take care of that. If you got a question and want it answered this time next week by yours truly. But the first question I wanted to get into here today comes from Riley Lakeland who emailed in the podcast and asked, which under the radar prospect do you think has a chance to be a sneaky good NHL or let me go and look at my Blackhawks prospect list here real fast. Cause uh, I don't want to be forgetting about someone or I want to see if there could be a good, like sneaky depth guy. Um, you know who I'm going to say, and I don't know if he's under the radar at all, but Gavin Hayes, I really think could be a good NHL player and someone who's probably not inside um, most top 10 prospect list for the Chicago Blackhawks. But he has been on fire this season in terms of the goal scoring. I believe he now has uh, 15 goals in 19 games since being traded from the Flint Firebirds to the Sioux Greyhounds. He's been red hot there. I think he's got 34 goals on the season now. Looks like he's going to be a 40-goal scorer in the OHL for the second consecutive season. And what I loved in addition to that is when he played for the United States at the World Juniors and won a gold medal with them this past winter, he wasn't in that offensive-minded role like he is with the Greyhounds or like he was with the Flint Firebirds before he got traded. He was someone who was down in the lineup a little bit, kind of used as uh, the 13th or 14th forward, but got an opportunity to play on the penalty kill, show off his size, which is a, a little bit of a forgotten piece to his puzzle considering how good of a goal scorer he is. But I think those are the types of things that, are actually what's going to make him most valuable if he does reach the NHL level. Because I think he could be a good third-line guy that has displayed goal-scoring abilities. I don't know if he's going to be able to light the lamp as frequently as he does right here, right now, at the highest level. But I think rounding out his game with an ability to play on the penalty kill and using his size and physicality a little bit, turning into someone who could be a good net front presence, adding those to his arsenal I think is truly what's going to give Gavin Hayes the best chance of being a meaningful player for the Blackhawks during this rebuild, because if everything goes right with the high draft picks that they have and Connor Bedard, Oliver Moore, Frank Nazar, all the money they're going to have in free agency to spend, I think the goal scoring, that's not really the biggest need for the Blackhawks long-term. And I hope that to be the case. Um, While Gavin Hayes can offer you that, I don't think that's, necessarily what the Blackhawks would kind of have him penciled into the lineup to do. Yeah, maybe he could be a second power play type of guy, but I think his versatility and what he can provide you away from the puck is really what could make him the most intriguing to the Blackhawks organization and why I think he could be a good bottom six fit one day down the road. So the guy I'm going to go with here, Riley, is uh, Gavin Hayes, who I had at number 14 in my Chicago Blackhawks recent midseason prospect ranking. So Gavin Hayes, definitely someone to keep an eye on um, these next couple of years. Could even be joining the professional scene after the conclusion of this season with the Greyhounds. Next question I have here today comes from BK underscore Fisher 12 on X, who asked, hard to watch this on ice version of the Hawks after many years of being spoiled with cup winning teams. I know exactly how you feel, BK. With an evident lack of depth compared to other teams, how will they get back to competing? Slowly and surely, unfortunately, BK. 
yeah, really clear that what the Blackhawks have right now is not even close to good enough. But with what Kyle Davidson has been able to accumulate in draft picks over the past couple of years and the players he selected there, plus the future picks that he has in his bag as well, um, the Blackhawks are going to have, they already do have, and will continue to have one of the best prospect pools in the NHL, I believe, for the next three, four, five years. And I, I think their best way of getting back to playing that level of hockey once again is just developing these guys properly, hoping that you hit on all of these draft picks and also making the most of the money that they have available in terms of free agency. I think it's got to be a perfect combination of both. Um, but that's kind of the plan for the Blackhawks is to develop these guys rather nicely over these next two to three to four years. And then as, you know, the 2025 free agent class creeps up, that's absolutely stacked. I think that's when they're going to be wanting to spend some of that money. So that's kind of their plan. Let Connor Bedard develop, give him some good help with prospects and through free agency and whatnot. And look, the Blackhawks being original six team, having a long legacy, being an iconic franchise, playing at the UC, the anthem with Jim Cornelison, along with playing with Connor Bedard. There's a lot of reasons why free agents and other players are going to be enticed to join on with the Blackhawks in the future years. It's really tough right now. And again, it is going to be slowly and surely. That's the most painful part of it. But I do think it's a proper plan that the Blackhawks are on right now. Um, and I give Kyle Davidson a lot of credit because it was a very difficult decision for him to sign up for this when he first took over as general manager. But yeah, the Blackhawks, what they're putting out on ice right now is less than ideal, but their prospect pool and all the help that should be coming in these next few years are why I am really high on this organization. And I think out of all the Chicago sports teams that are rebuilding right now or stuck in that like ground level, I undoubtedly, and this is unbiasedly, I undoubtedly have the most confidence that the Chicago Blackhawks are going to want going to be the ones to turn it around because of all their draft picks, all the money they have to spend in free agency. And oh yeah, they have that 18 year old phenom counter Bedard. The next question comes from at Kyle Tavener on YouTube who asked, I wonder if they should have grabbed Evgeny Kuznetsov off of waivers. That's an upgrade on skills to play with Bedsy and a cap hit we can take in sort of need. Yeah. I think the mindset is right. And, I wouldn't have hated that move, but also there are some off ice issues going on with Evgeny Kuznetsov that he's dealt with throughout his entire career. And someone who just, there have been questions about his effort level and what he brings to the table when he's not rolling offensively. Those have really been the concerns for him ever since he helped the Capitals win the Stanley cup. I think the, the, the idea of adding someone like that is correct, Kyle, but I think Evgeny Kuznetsov is not the right guy for that situation. Shout out to my uncle Marty here who wanted to ask in a question this week. Question was, right now, would you trade Bedard for McDavid? If yes or no, why? And I'm assuming this is from the Chicago Blackhawks perspective. Trading Connor Bedard for Connor McDavid, it's a fascinating question. And I think you, there's really no wrong answer here. Um, if I were the Blackhawks, though, I think I'd say no. Just because, listen, is Connor McDavid the best player in the world? Absolutely. He hasn't won a Stanley Cup with the Oilers trying to win alongside him. And the Oilers have certainly had a better roster for the last handful of years than the Blackhawks do right here, right now. Would it be incredible to have Connor McDavid? Absolutely. But with his deal, or with... um. The situation that the Blackhawks are in right now, there's no way that they would be able to win right here, right now with Connor McDavid. Like it would still be a couple of years until they get a good enough team around him to actually go and win the whole thing. And by the time that happens, what McDavid's going to be 30, 31 years old where Connor Bedard, you just have so many more years to open up that window of opportunity again, because he is still only 18 years old and he's still on his ELC. You don't have to pay him yet. That opens things up for a couple of other maneuvers and just situations like that. Look, Connor McDavid is absolutely the best player in the NHL, but I just don't know what trading Connor Bedard for Connor McDavid will, would change for the Blackhawks right here, right now. They get a little bit better right now. Absolutely. But are they still good enough to win the whole thing? I don't know. And maybe with all the money that they have in free agency next year, if they did take on McDavid, it's a hypothetical question. Uh, they could probably go and get enough pieces to make it competitive. But even then, you need elite level depth to go and win the Stanley Cup, to win 16 games in the most meaningful months of the season. And 
I just don't know if the Blackhawks would be able to accomplish that in a short-term enough goal where it would be worth taking on an older Connor McDavid rather than Connor Bedard. So if I were the Blackhawks, I'd say no, but I think this is a really fascinating question, and I want all of you uh, who are still tuned into this point of today's episode to go and comment your feelings on that question and on my um on my answer, go and comment that down below. Cause I'm really curious to see if everyone feels the same about this as I do. If people feel differently, uh, it's a hypothetical question. It's all fun and games. So go and let me know what you think about that in the comment section down below. Last question I got here today comes from Explorer travel on X who asked, has there been any buzz on players like Bavillier or Tyler Johnson on possible trades and, and the, and are the Blackhawks looking to add undrafted collegiate players to the talent pool? Um, first, first question, Anthony Beauvillier, don't really see him being moved because of his cap hit Tyler Johnson. I do think he or Colin Blackwell are the most likely guys to get moved. Uh, I want to say it was Chris Johnston from the athletic released his top 50 names to keep an eye on throughout the, uh, this trade deadline week until Friday's deadline reaches. Tyler Johnson was the only member of the Blackhawks to crack that list at number 41. So don't know if the Blackhawks are going to be making moves whatsoever. I haven't really heard any buzz on either of those two guys, but Johnson and Blackwell, to me, are the two to keep an eye on. And then are the Blackhawks looking to add undrafted collegiate free agents, free agents to the talent pool? Absolutely. This is something that I think the Blackhawks try to capitalize on year in and year out. I believe they were in the conversation for Brock Faber, not like seriously, but their, their name was thrown around there. And we've seen it happen with a few guys. Mike Hardman, uh, there have been a handful of players that the Blackhawks have gone after in these certain in these exact situations. So um, I haven't heard any rumors of certain players or whatnot, but wouldn't be surprised at all to see the Blackhawks go out and try to sign uh, one of these college free agents whenever their season does come to a close. All right, folks, I think that is going to wrap up today's episode of Locked On Blackhawks. As always, thank you all again for tuning into the show. Be sure to go and follow Locked On Blackhawks for free right now, wherever you may be listening to your podcast, and to go and subscribe to Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube. And that way, you can get the latest episode as soon as it becomes available each and every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. Go and give me a follow on X at Jack Bushman too. And make sure to go and follow my strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. So until tomorrow's episode, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Let's see if the Blackhawks can hang in there this evening with the Colorado Avalanche. I'll see you next time on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.